As I started making this video, news started to trickle in that the Azerbaijanian army has commenced military operations against the Armenian enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh and fighting there in the southern Caucasus is now underway. This has been a crisis that has been brewing and developing for some time and it now seems to have um, started in earnest. There's also a report that the Russian air defence system has shot down four Storm Shadow missiles launched by Ukraine towards the Crimean Bridge. Again, this is a report that I've only just seen as I began making this video. I'm going to cover both of these reports in my next video tomorrow as more news comes in. The Nagorno-Karabakh crisis, about which Alex Christoforo and I have just done a programme on the Duran, uh, which you can see, uh, as I said, has been a developing process for some time. The Crimean Bridge attack, if it, is, if it has indeed happened, is of course part of a pattern of similar attacks that Ukraine has been making against the Crimean Bridge ever since the explosive device which was used against the Crimean Bridge in October last year. Anyway, let's proceed with the subject matters of this programme today. As I said, I'll have to cover these two other stories in my next video, which will appear tomorrow, in which obviously there'll be a lot more information as to what exactly is going on with those two other stories. But let's focus on today's programme. And there's actually quite a lot of news, um, firstly about the situation on the battlefronts, or to be precise, about the lack of news from the battlefronts. I'd like to revisit the interview that Kirill Budanov, the Ukrainian intelligence chief, has given to The Economist. And then the most important news of all is very intense diplomatic activity which has been underway between the United States, China and Russia with the focal person, the person who's involved in all of these various discussions, being China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi. But let's start, first of all, with the situation on the battlefronts. And here I think the first thing to say is that, again, there's been remarkably little in the way of news. There's actually some reports that in the Vremovka salient area, specifically around the Novodonets area, the Ukrainians have actually pulled their troops back, not as a result of fighting, but apparently the forces that were concentrated in this area have actually been withdrawn some distance away from the battlefronts, presumably for some kind of attempt at reconstitution. And in the Bakhmut area, which has been the scene of extremely intense fighting over the last few days, with a major Ukrainian attempt to try to capture Klesheevka and Andreevka and plausibly the somewhat bigger village or indeed small town of Kordyumovka a little to the east. Anyway, the, the attacks there seem to have subsided over the last few hours. As I said yesterday, the Ukrainians announced that they'd captured Klesheevka. Um, there's been some scepticism now about that story, not just from me and others, as I discussed extensively yesterday, but I noticed in the Strana website, Strana is a Ukrainian website, that it must be said one which is very critical of the Ukrainian government and which I understand publishes from abroad. Anyway, Strana also questions the Ukrainian claim as to whether or not they really are in control of Klesheevka. And it points out that after the initial claims 
were made that Kleshevka had fallen under Ukrainian control, the information service of the military unit, the Ukrainian military unit, that is trying to capture Kleshevka, actually came out with a story that appeared to contradict that. It spoke about fighting continuing in Kleshevka. Subsequently, it appears to have been, it appears to have fallen into line with the main story that was coming from Kiev, uh, from Zelensky and Sirsky and the others, that the Ukrainians are indeed now in control of Kleshevka. Well, I remain clearly of the view that this is a premature statement. Denis Pushilin, not always, it must be said, the most reliable commentator, but for what it's worth, um, Denis Pushilin, the head of the Donetsk uh, regional government, um, which is, of course, a Russian-supported regional government. Anyway, he's actually said that Klesheevka and Andreevka are largely in this grey zone. No one controls them entirely, and there is a Ukrainian and Russian presence, as I understand it, in each of these places. I think this is the summary of the position. I went through Boris Rozhin's account of what the situation is in Klesheevka and Andreevka yesterday, and as far as I can see, nothing significant has changed about that. The point is, the key thing to understand is that this major effort to capture Klesheevka which probably hasn't captured Kleshevka, at least hasn't resulted in Ukrainian consolidation of control of Kleshevka, this major Ukrainian attempt, after more than four months of offensive in this region, Ukraine began its offensive in the Bakhmut area back in May, after more than four months of offensive in this region, has managed perhaps to push most of the Russian forces out of Kleshevka. It has not resulted in Ukrainian control of Kleshevka, and it has failed to breach the key Russian defence lines to the southwest of Bakhmut. So that's, it seems to me, the entirety of the story there. Um, major effort, very little gained. Kleshevka itself is hardly the objective, uh, a worthwhile Ukrainian objective in this area. But anyway, that's Bakhmut, that's the Vremivka salient area. There's been more reports of more fighting in the Rabotino, um, Verbovoye area. I'm finding it difficult to keep up with all of the reports. There's one report which claims that there was a Russian flank attack from a village called Kopani, which is to the uh, west of Rabotino. There was a Russian flank attack um, trying to um, cut off Ukrainian forces that have been trying to push to the southwest of Rabotino. I'm not absolutely able to give a overall picture of uh, to, to give a detailed picture of what is happening there but again suffice to say Robotino itself is not fully under Ukrainian control in fact the Russians still appear to control some parts of it Verbovoye further to the east is fully under Russian control I say that I know that there are Ukrainian maps that claim the contrary but I'm satisfied that that is the reality of the situation. The Ukrainians have been making various attacks in this area over the last couple of days. I get the sense that the level of attacks for the time being has actually diminished. And the latest reports from the Russians say that the situation is stably tense, but that the Russians retain basically that they have the situation in this area under control. And I think that is right. Again, I don't see any sign, any information, which points to any sort of breakthrough in this area at all.
Now, further north, as I've discussed, the Russians have advanced close to the Oskol River and close to Kupiansk. They've made major advances over the course of the summer um, in these directions, but again, they seem to have stopped their advances around the Sinkovka uh, ledge area. They are apparently well within sight now of um, Kupiansk itself, but they show no inclination to attack this town. And if you go again to the Russian Defense Ministry reports, it seems as if the fighting in this area has died down, that the Russians are biding their time, waiting for the appropriate moment to strike. Now, that seems to me the overall situation. As I discussed yesterday, if it remains like this, then this is a strategic victory for the Russians and a strategic defeat for Ukraine. It was, after all, Ukraine that went on the offensive over the course of this summer, an offensive that was supposed to result in the capture of Tokmak, Milotopol, and a breakthrough to the Sea of Azov, and a severing of the Russian land bridge. We are now... Um, in the second half of September, three and a half months of intense fighting and extremely heavy Ukrainian losses have um, ensued after this offensive began. But Ukraine doesn't seem to be anywhere close to achieving any one of its objectives. Now, I say that. Over the last couple of days, there's been some rather interesting comments from some Western officials, and perhaps the most interesting one is from General Milley. And he's talked about the fact that the offensive has now only limited objectives, and he seems to be leaving open the possibility that Ukraine might still achieve these limited objectives of this offensive. He says that uh, advancing to the 1991 borders, which nobody ever said that Ukraine would do over the course of this particular offensive. But anyway, advancing to the 1991 borders is unachievable, but Ukraine still has the possibility of achieving its limited objectives. And it's become clear to me that over the last couple of days, there's been some kind of discussion and decision, a discussion and decision between the Ukrainians and the Americans and the British that instead of working towards an advance towards the Sea of Azov or the capture of Milotopol, something which everybody now accepts is beyond... Ukraine's ability to do, that the objective instead should be to try to reach Tokmak. This is the largest town, about 15 kilometers south of the Surovikin line. It was originally, when the offensive was first touted, seen as a stepping stone on the way to Milotopol, and of course Milotopol itself was seen as a stepping stone to the Sea of Azov. Nobody seems to believe that the Sea of Azov is destination is any longer achievable, so there seems to have been an agreement, a sort of private agreement reached at some level that from this point on the objective is no longer to break through all the way to the Sea of Azov, but to try to capture Tokmak before the autumn rains and the autumn mud close in. Or if not to catch a Tokmak, at least to reach it. Tokmak, I should say, is heavily fortified. There's uh, large belts of fortifications located around Tokmak, most probably there are 
heavy minefields and other such things around Tokmak. Capturing Tokmak, on the face of it, looks like a complex, difficult operation. It might also be unachievable. But the theory is, if Ukraine can at least breach the first part of the Surovikin line and advance somewhat further and reach Tokmak itself, that will be at least something that can be described as a victory, a way of ending the offensive on a high note. And I notice, for example, that people like Robert Clark in the Daily Telegraph are now talking about Togmac and the British intelligence, uh, British defence uh, um, bulletin also talks about Togmac. It talks about the Russians making preparations to defend Togmac because supposedly they're concerned about the Ukrainian breakthroughs further north in the Rabotino Verbovoye sector. So that might be what has been talked about and agreed. And of course, if it is what has been agreed, the first thing to say is that this would be a major scaling back of the original objectives of the offensive. People might want to pretend otherwise now, but the offensive as it was originally presented was an offensive to break through the Russian defences and reach the Sea of Azov. And if not at the Sea of Azov, at least Militopol. If not now, Militopol is not the objective. The Sea of Azov is not the objective. This place, Tokmak, has become the objective instead. And we're hearing all kinds of claims, all sorts of reports that if Tokmak is reached, as I said, I'm not absolutely sure about whether the talk is actually about capturing Tokmak. If Tokmak is reached, then that will put Ukrainian artillery in a position where they can interdict Russian convoys, Russian vehicles, as they trundle <laughs> along the land bridge to reinforce Russian positions. Now, Brian Boletic, in his most recent program, he has basically demolished that particular ar argument, placing Ukrainian artillery in those kind of positions would not, in fact, disrupt Russian logistics and communications in the way that some people say and perhaps think. But anyway, perhaps talking about things in that way is less helpful than understanding that whatever rationalization might be constructed to justify calling an advance on Tokmak a success, it would actually be a it would actually be an attempt to explain away the greater failure that there's not been an advance all the way to the Sea of Azov. Now, having said that, of course, all that presupposes that Ukrainians in the next, well, 30 days or 45 days or whatever it is that they have until the weather closes in, uh, that they are going to be able to reach Tokmak. And at the moment, I have to say that there is little sign that they are able to do so. They have been trying for three and a half months to break through in the Rabotino Verbovoye sector. The um, British media outlet admitted that Rabotino, this small village of about 480 people, was supposed to be captured by the Ukrainians within the first days of the offensive. I actually think that the intention was, the, the assumption was, that it would be captured on the first day of the offensive, which is to say on the four, or, or, in, in this sector on the 7th of June. But the fact is, it hasn't been captured. And quite recently, 
in a long piece that he's done about the fighting um, in this offensive. Big Serge, who I presume has some understanding of these things. Anyway, he said that realistically, a further advance towards the south through the Sudovikin line towards Topmak is not practical for Ukraine unless they finally break the Russian defense system in this area by capturing Robotino and Verbovoye first. So they haven't yet achieved that. They've been trying to achieve it for three and a half months. Maybe over the next couple of weeks, they will make a renewed effort to do it. But assuming they do achieve that, they do succeed in doing that, well, they then have only a limited amount of time, perhaps three weeks, perhaps four, perhaps six weeks, I'm not going to try and say exactly how long, in order to capture Tokmak or at least reach Tokmak itself by breaking through the powerful defences of the Surovikin line. Now, I'm not saying it can't be done, I'm just saying that it doesn't seem to me plausible that it can be, but, you know, we'll have to wait and see. One point I would make is that a person, uh, one of my private correspondents, has sent me a, um, via an email, um, information about a comment that a US officer has recently made, which is that Ukraine is now firing 7,000 shells a day. It would like to increase that to 10,000 shells a day, but that this is far greater than the burn rate. Uh, this is a far higher burn rate of shells than the United States can sustain from its current production, which would, of course, be absolutely the case. Now, if Ukraine is, in fact, firing 7,000 shells a day, at this particular juncture, then that is more than the one to 2,000 shells a day that it was firing. So it seems at the start of September, we've had that from two sources. Firstly, there was um, Scott of Calibrated who said it was one to 2,000 rounds a day, and he obtained it from a very reliable source. And he explained that on a program he did on the 1st of September with a new atlas with Brian Balletic. And there was another report a short time later that said that the Ukrainian firing rate had increased, well, was two to 3,000 rounds a day, slightly more perhaps than Scott of Calibrate. It thought it was on the 1st of September. Perhaps there was an increase. And perhaps the Ukrainians have increased their firing rate even further to 7,000 rounds a day. Maybe these renewed efforts around um, Bakhmut in Klesheevka and Kordyumovka, and perhaps this, the attack that took place a short time ago around near Opitnoye in the Avdeevka region, and maybe, possibly, just possibly, heavier shelling taking place around um, Verbovoye and Rabotino marks an increase in Ukrainian shelling. Maybe the Ukrainians have decided to go for broke, that they are now running through whatever remains of their shell um, arsenal at a higher rate than before. And they're doing that in order to try to suppress the Russian artillery in the Rabotino Verbovoye area. Um, Zelensky has said that it is largely an artillery duel now, with each side engaging in counter battery work against the other. Maybe the Ukrainians are trying to do that, burning through their shell stock at an accelerated rate, because they hope that way to weaken Russian defenses in order to achieve this push, this breakthrough towards um, towards Tokmak. I don't know. I mean, these are, this is all very vague. I'm just passing on information now 
no doubt we will find out more in due course. But anyway, that is the situation on the battlefronts. The Russians have been launching massive drone attacks against Ukraine. They did so again last night. More Geranium-2 drones. More Geranium-2 drones being used at the moment than, uh, than cruise missiles. Again, my sense is that the Russian objective is less to uh, destroy ground targets, more to force the Ukrainians to expend their precious remaining stock of what is now largely Western missiles, air defense missiles, in advance of whatever it is that the Russians are planning over the course of the winter as they stockpile missiles for the big offensive, the big missile offensive that looks like it's coming. And whilst I'm on the topic of Russian missile attacks, there's now been a very interesting article in the New York Times which says that the attack, the destruction of the market in Konstantinovka was not done by a Russian missile, but by a Ukrainian air defense missile falling to earth, that it was a Ukrainian missile that did the damage, not a Russian one. Now, I think this is a most interesting admission, by the way, because the Russians have been saying that this kind of thing has been happening on a fairly regular basis throughout the course of the conflict. They've often reported that claims that the Russians have destroyed residential buildings with their missiles when it has happened are simply wrong, that it is mainly a case of Ukrainian air defense missiles falling to earth. But for the first time, as far as I'm aware, an American newspaper, and in fact, the newspaper of record, the New York Times, no less, has admitted that this is indeed the case, at least in this one instance. Now, I think that is interesting. And of course, it again begs the question of why is this story appearing now? Of course, it could be that the New York Times has carried out a proper investigation on the spot, possibly. But it could also be, and perhaps more plausibly is, because the United States is annoyed at the moment with Ukraine. It is conscious that Zelensky is coming to New York and to Washington. And this is a further signal to him on the eve of his visit that the United States is not happy with him and not happy with the general situation in Ukraine. Just saying, because that's the only explanation I c that makes plausible sense to me. I think if the New York Times had really wanted to investigate these sorts of incidents in the past, well, it would have been relatively easy for them to do. So anyway, that's the situation on the battlefronts. The Ukrainians apparently have now agreed that Tokmak, not the Sea of Azov, is the objective of the offensive. They have to get there first. It's far from clear to me that they can, but even that represents a major scaling down of the offensive. And, of course, in the meantime, the situation on the front lines has been, shall we say, stably, stably tense. In other words, static. Now, let's look at some other pieces of news. Firstly, the Daily Telegraph, interestingly, is reporting that, based on a Russian source from Rostec, the Russian company that operates arms production, that the Russians have indeed increased arms production by very high amounts, tenfold, we're sometimes told, to supply their army in Ukraine. And I've just seen a report that Russia has resumed production 
in Omsk. The Omsk factory in Russia has resumed production of the advanced T-80 tanks previously designed by the Soviet Union, which of course, like the M1 Abrams tanks, use what is apparently a rather more reliable and simpler gas turbine engine. But anyway, that's one piece of industry news. But this brings me to the interview that Kirill Budanov, the intelligence chief, has recently given to The Economist. And again, we are told that um, he is, Budanov is, uh, well, that he was looking calm and rested. Now, why does The Economist, when it interviews people like Zelensky and Budanov, go out of the way repeatedly to tell us that they are calm? Why does it assume that we might think that they might not be calm? Just asking. I think it's an odd thing to say. And in fact, it begs the question whether they really are as calm, at least to me, as calm in these interviews as The Economist would like us to think. But anyway, he, the interview is an interesting one for various reasons. It does give an insight into Budanov's personality. But um, we have some really interesting comments from him. He says that he is in no mood to debate his country's ongoing counteroffensive. Interesting fact, he doesn't want to talk about the counteroffensive at all, it seems. He says, facts, not discussion, are what motivate General Budanov. Facts, not discussion. So why are the two in conflict? Why not discuss facts? Surely that's what an interview is all about. But he doesn't want to discuss the facts about the offensive. Um, that's not something that he feels is an appropriate topic to discuss during the offensive. He's not prepared to discuss the offensive itself. Except he does say this. He says, he, we're told that he says that um, uh, the slow pace of advance against a dug-in and well-prepared enemy is simply a reflection of reality. Budanov do not, does not understand those who predicted a quick collapse of the Russian lines. Is a pencil strong or weak? It depends how you look at it. The counteroffensive is ongoing. Ukraine still has time. There is more than a month before the muddy season sets in. And that's a fact. Now, I have to say that comment, that whole comment from Budanov leaves me absolutely speechless because if there is anyone who has been spending his time over the last year or so predicting rapid Ukrainian advances, particularly in this offensive, well, it's been Budanov himself, or at least that's the impression he has been giving. I'm not going to pretend that I've read through every single thing that he said, perhaps he's qualified things in some way. But really, I mean, if anyone else has been more optimistic about the prospects than him, well, I'm not quite sure who precisely on the Ukrainian and the Western side that is. But anyway, we then um, go on to read that uh, he says it is Russia, not Ukraine, that has reason to fret. Uh, Russia's first line of defence, the all-important southern axis in Zaporozhye, has already been pierced in places, meaning that the operation to sever the land connections between Russia and Crimea may yet be achieved. It doesn't sound so sure before winter sets in. <laughs> um, and then we have this very strange comment. Ukraine may already have drawn on limited numbers of its reserve troops, but Russia is now in seeming desperation, known to be committing under strength reserves that it has not planned to deploy until not planned to deploy 
until late October. Now, that comment seems to me wrong <laughs> on at least two levels. He says that Ukraine may have already have drawn on limited numbers of its reserve troops. Well, again, I have to revert here to what the Russians have been saying, Russian telegram channels, and Russian commentators, and the Russian Ministry of Defense. They say that Ukraine has committed all its troops, all its major reserve troops, the reserve troops that were supposed to be used in the offensive. It committed the Ninth Corps at the start of the offensive. That was supposed to break through, and that didn't succeed. Then they committed the 10th Corps at the end of July. That was supposed to be the force that was going to exploit the breakthrough, and that didn't work either. Then at the end of August, they trundled out the 82nd Air Assault Brigade and the Maroon Tactical Group, and it made, managed to break into Robotino, but it wasn't able to capture the place, and the Ukrainians have carved out a salient in the fields between uh, Robotino and Verbovoye, but as I've said already, they haven't, to my mind, broken through the um, lines, the Russian lines. And then according to the Russian Defense Ministry, Ukraine was been obliged to commit the 71st Jaeger Brigade from its strategic reserve. So, again, unless all of this that we've been hearing for weeks and months is all Russian imagination and Russian fiction, which I don't believe, then when Budanov says that only limited numbers of Ukraine's reserve troops have been drawn into the fight, he's clearly not being entirely fact. Uh, he's not being actually factual. But then it's the next part that really interests me. He says that Russia is now in seeming desperation known to be committing understrength reserves that it had not planned to deploy until late October. And then he says that contrary to what the Russian Federation declares, it has absolutely no strategic reserve. Russia's 25th Combined Arms Army, now being prematurely deployed in the Eastern Front around Liman and Kupiansk, has only 80% of its manpower and 55% of the equipment it was supposed to have, he says. Now, here I have to say straight away that the 25th Combined Arms Army, which has been conducting the Russian offensive towards Kupiansk and Kupiansk and Liman, is surely not part of the Russian defense effort in Zaporozhye, and Donbass. Um, it's interesting that when Budanov is asked to discuss the state of Russian reserves and the kind of reserves that Russia is obliged supposedly to tap in order to strengthen its positions, he refers to a force that far from being involved in defence and far from forming part of a reserve force on the part of the Russian military, is in fact a force that has been engaged in an offensive that has gained an awful lot of ground right through the entire summer period. So he's telling the economist something which is misleading. He's giving a misleading impression about the state of Russia's strategic reserve based upon what he says is the condition of an army, the 25th Combined Arms Army, which actually has been engaged for several weeks now conducting an offensive. 
And by the way, he might be right about the fact that currently its manpower rate levels are at 80% and um, that it has only 55% of its equipment. The Russian Combined Arms Army, the 25th Combined Arms Army, has been, as I said, engaged in an offensive in the Kupiansk Oskol River Liman sector now for several weeks. It's, it would be unsurprising if there had not been some erosion of forces. Um, if it's down to 80% of its manpower strength and 55% of its equipment, and by equipment I presume he means vehicles, tanks, things of that kind, well, they all need repairs. They've been intensively used for several months. It's understandable that there's been a rundown of the equipment, that anybody who has had any experience using heavy equipment knows that happens. And that might indeed be the reason why we see the pause in the advance to towards Kupiansk, because the Combined Arms Army, 25th Combined Arms Army, after having engaged in a rapid advance over several months, weeks, um, now needs time to refill, refit and build up its strength. So, but to reiterate again, it's misleading to refer to this as part of its strategic reserve. Then Budanov goes on to say that um, amid reports that Russia is poised to step up its ongoing mo mobilization drive, I presume this is the decision to increase the size of the Russian army with contract soldiers. Putin and Shoigu say it's growing by a thousand men a month, a day rather. We, we read that Budana says that headcount is the only obvious advantage that Russia still retains over Ukraine. Human resources in Russia are relatively speaking unlimited. The quality is low, but the quantity is sufficient. As far as other components of the war effort are concerned, Russian resources are being exhausted and a reckoning is coming. Russia's economy will hold out only until 2025. The flow of weapons will dry up in 2026, perhaps earlier, though the economist goes on to say the evidence to support his claim is patchy. Now, that makes me wonder about something, because it is an endlessly repeated mantra in the British media that Russian troops, the morale of Russian troops is low, that, and that Russia has no reserves. That if the Ukrainians are able to break through the Russian lines, there are no Russian reserves to counter them. And this is, of course, exactly what Budanov is telling us here. Now, I wonder whether the British are getting this information from Budanov. And I wonder whether Budana himself, where he's getting his information from, I wonder whether he is relying on information from a single source, presumably some middle-ranking officer in the Russian military system, who is well, passing on information about Russia being out of reserves. Because... Nothing else, none of the other information that I see remotely corroborates that claim. And it seems to me that the entire premise that Ukraine can still achieve some kind of breakthrough, some sort of advance, all the way to Tokmak, for example, is based now very heavily on the assumption that the Russians have no reserves. Now... I have to say, I don't know that Budanov is getting this information from a single source, but it would not surprise me if he is. That has been the pattern with many intelligence debacles that I've read about and am familiar with. Um, intelligence sources can sometimes make up things or exaggerate things, telling 
person, the intelligence agency that's paying them what they think the intelligence agency wants to hear. And I can understand that Budanov, given his views, wants to believe this source. And I can see why the British would want to believe Budanov. Because, of course, the British don't have the enormous intelligence gathering capabilities that the United States does. So they might be wanting to impress the Americans by saying that they have a particular reliable information because they're particularly close to Ukrainian intelligence, to, to Budanov specifically, and that Budanov has reliable sources within Russia. Anyway, this is all speculation, but as I said, I, I know that how this sort of thing can happen, but as I said, the resemblance between the things that Budanov is saying and the things I'm reading every day in the British media are very striking, and I can't help but think that it is in fact the British media, rather, that it is from Budanov that the British are getting this information, that the Ukraine, that the Russians are running out of reserves. I have to say that I think that is absolute nonsense. Again, quite apart, setting apart the fact that there is this big build-up underway in Russia. We also have the independent information from Media Zona, which has tracked Russian casualties and has shown that Russian casualties over the period of August and September have been falling to low levels, even as Ukrainian losses over the course of the offensive have been spiking. Now, that would suggest to me, if it's the Ukrainians who are suffering the big losses and the Russians who are suffering the small losses, that it must be the Ukrainians, not the Russians, who are running down their reserves. That seems to me logical, and it is the only uh, explanation of the situation that, to my mind, makes sense. But the British want to believe otherwise, so they're listening to what Budanov is telling them, and, of course, Budanov, in turn, perhaps is getting this from a source in Russia that he wants to listen to. And, well, the source may be stringing him along. By the way, I wonder also whether one of the purposes of Budanov's various James Bond operations in Russia, the assassinations, the bomb attacks, the drone attacks, those sorts of things, isn't also in order to convince the British that he does actually have an, an extensive and intelligence, an, uh, an extensive and effective intelligence operation on the ground in Russia. Of course, penetrating the Kremlin and the Russian Ministry of Defense is a very different thing and having a few people around who can plant bombs on the Kerch Bridge or launch drones against an airfield in Pskov. But I can see how it might impress some people. Anyway, um, that's Budanov's interview. Uh, further on, he does make it fairly clear that he doesn't expect um, the war to end quickly. And he ends that the war, we, we understand we will not end the war with a victory parade in Moscow, but neither should Moscow ever hope to hold one in Kiev, which strongly suggests, as I discussed in my programme yesterday, that he too is preparing for a long war. Though, interestingly, at one point, he sort of comes close to admitting that a long war might not be ideal for Ukraine. But anyway, he, he clearly is preparing for the fact that there isn't going to be an outright Ukrainian victory this year.
and his refusal to discuss the offensive says as much. Anyway, I wanted to discuss Budanov's article because, as I said, we see the quality of the intelligence that he's providing. He refuses to discuss the offensive in any detail. He gives completely misleading information about the 25th Combined Arms Army of the Russian army. And, of course, he talks about Russia having no reserves whatsoever, despite the fact that, well, as I said, independent evidence suggests that it's Ukrainian losses that are rising, Russian losses that are falling, and all other evidence suggests the contrary. I'm going to suggest that if I'm right, and if the British are getting their information from Budanov, and if Budanov is getting his information from some source in Russia, that the Americans have been much more sceptical about all of this for some time, and that their level of scepticism is growing by the day. Anyway, that's one thing I wanted to discuss. Let's now talk about the very interesting diplomatic activity that is underway, because it turns out that over the weekend... The Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi had a meeting with no less a person than Jake Sullivan, um, apparently in Malta. And the meeting was, I suspect, intended to be secret, or at least private. Um, the Chinese have not published a readout of the meeting. They probably hoped that it would be kept private. But the Americans, the White House, has now published a readout. And it's, as always with the American readouts, fairly short. It says National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan met on September 16th to 17th with uh, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi in Malta. This meeting was part of ongoing efforts to maintain open lines of communication and responsibly manage the relationship. The both, both the two sides had candid, substantive, and constructive discussions, building on the engagements between President Biden and President Xi in Bali, Indonesia, in November 2022. That was last year. This meeting follows on recent high-level engagements, including between National Security Advisor Sullivan and Director Wang Yi in May in Vienna, as well as meetings between Secretary Blinken, Secretary Yellen, Special Envoy Kerry, and Secretary Raimondo and their counterparts in Beijing over the last several months. The, dis the two sides discussed key issues in US-China bilateral relationship, global and regional security issues, Russia's war against Ukraine, and cross-strait issues, amongst other topics. The United States noted the importance of peace and stability across the Taiwan state, Strait. The two sides committed to maintaining the strategic channel of communication and to pursue additional high-level engagement and consultation in key areas between the United States and the People's Republic of China in the coming months. That really doesn't tell us very much, except that this was a lengthy meeting, took up much of the weekend, and that it happened in Malta. And the Americans leaked it, the Chinese didn't. I get the sense that the Chinese will not be happy about the fact that the details of this meeting the fact of this meeting was leaked. Anyway, what's this all about? Well, the story of this year is of unending American attempts to try to get some kind of dialogue going with the Chinese. And the Chinese being listening to what the Americans are saying pushing back on a lot of what the Americans are saying, but refusing to engage in the way that the Americans want them to. And again, I get the sense that 
this meeting, which I suspect was set up in something of a hurry, was a shocked response to the failure of Xi Jinping to show up in Delhi, the fact that at the G20 meeting, the fact that Xi Jinping did not have the expected meeting that the Americans were hoping for with Biden in Delhi. The Americans are very keen to get a meeting between Biden and Xi Jinping up and happening so that they can persuade everybody that even as the United States continues to build up in the Pacific, strengthen Taiwan, it's now diverting weaponry that was intended for Egypt to Taiwan, for example. Even as the United States want, does all of these things, it wants to lull the world and even to some extent the Chinese into thinking that things with China are actually okay, the situation is stable, there is no serious cause for concern. And I think the Chinese are not happy about this, and that is why Xi Jinping didn't come to the G20 meeting, and there's now talk that he doesn't want to attend a further meeting in San Francisco in a few weeks where he was expected to go. And I think that the Americans were concerned about this, so on his way to Europe, the Americans contacted Wang Yi, asked to meet him, Wang Yi agreed to a meeting. The Chinese always agree to meetings. The meeting took place in Malta. As I said, I think it was intended to be private. But the Americans, anxious to give the impression that relations with China were somehow coming back on track, then no doubt to Chinese annoyance, have gone ahead and leaked, well, something about the meeting to the world through this readout published by the White House. There's also apparently been briefings given, uh, private briefings given by the White House about what was discussed with Wang Yi. But anyway, there it is. Now, Wang Yi didn't just come to this part of the world in order to meet Sullivan. He then travelled to Russia and he's currently and uh, he's had a meeting in Russia with the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. And there's pictures of the two men. The Chinese Foreign Ministry has published a picture of the two men in the Russian Foreign Ministry guest house in Moscow. We see um, Lavrov and um, Wang Yi walking arm in arm on a carpeted floor. Lavrov appears to be smiling. And we've had a detailed Chinese readout. And the interesting thing is that this readout came out very fast. The meeting took place on the, on the 18th of September. Today is the 19th of September. And the Chinese, in other words, put together a readout very quickly. And the readout in part reads that Wang Yi said, under the strategic guidance of the two heads of state, China-Russia relations have maintained a momentum of sound and steady development with continuously deepening practical cooperation, rich and colourful people-to-people and cultural interactions, and fast-growing personnel exchanges. A China-Russia relationship featuring enduring good neighbourliness and friendship, comprehensive strategic cooperation, as well as mutually beneficial cooperation and win-win results, will continue to contribute to the two countries' respective development and revitalization and bring significant benefits to the two peoples. Well, we've heard all that before, but in other words, Wang Yi is saying, what a wonderful 
relationship we, China, have with you, Russia. And let's go on building it up and making it still better. And then, um, he goes on to say, um, when both China and Russia pursue an independent foreign policy and bilateral cooperation, in other words, between China and Russia, does not target any third party, is not subject to disruption by any third party, and is not swayed by any third party. As major countries in the world and permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, China and Russia bear important responsibilities for maintaining global strategic stability and promoting world development and progress. In the face of mounting unilateral acts, hegemonism and block confrontation, China and Russia should follow the trend of the times, demonstrate the responsibilities of major countries, fulfill their due international obligations, uphold true multilateralism, promote a multipolar world through continuously strengthening strategic dialogue, a, a strategic cooperation, so as to make global governance more just and equitable. Now, all of this is in the Chinese readout following a meeting with Sergei Lavrov, which follows directly upon a meeting between Wang Yi and Jake Sullivan. Let's just go over those words. China and Russia pursue an independent foreign policy and bilateral cooperation. So they're independent states. Their bilateral cooperation does not target any third party, is not subject to disruption by any third party, and is not swayed by any third party. Well, it's not difficult to guess who that third party is. It is clearly the United States. Wang Yi was clearly once again pressured by Jake Sullivan at the meeting in Malta to scale down cooperation between Russia and China. And Wang Yi said no, and he's gone out of his way it, over the course of a meeting with Sergei Lavrov and through this readout published immediately by the Chinese foreign ministry to make it clear that the United States, its pressure on China to distance itself from Russia is fruitless. It's not going to happen. The Chinese do not take kindly to these attempts to pressure them by the United States. And then we go on to read about how China and Russia have responsibilities to maintain global stability and provoke, promote development and progress and that they're doing so in the face of mounting unilateral acts, sanctions in other words, hegemonism, the attempt by the United States to assert its primacy in the world, as discussed by Secretary of State Blinken at inordinate length in his speech at Johns Hopkins University of a few days ago, which I've discussed in several programs, and block confrontation, the attempts by the United States to forge alliances in the Northeast Pacific, Japan, um, South Korea, the United States, to build up the AUKUS system into a kind of alliance against China, to win over states, members of the ASEAN group, like Vietnam, and of course, to expand, to expand in some form NATO into the Pacific region. So, Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign ministry, is stating in the clearest possible way that all of this is unacceptable to China. 
They value their relationship with Russia. It is China's decision which country it makes friends with. It's making friends with Russia. It is not creating a block with Russia against the United States. It will not be swayed by the United States. It will not be pressured by the United States. It will work together with the Russians to maintain global strategic stability and promote world development and progress. And it will resist unilateral acts, in other words, sanctions, hegemonism, and block confrontation. Well, it seems to me that whatever it was that Jake Sullivan was trying to achieve with Wang Yi in his meeting in Malta, that it has turned out badly. In fact, I'm going to suggest that it's precisely because the meeting turned out so badly, because Wang Yi clearly left that meeting angry with the Americans, angry with what Jake Sullivan was telling him, and pushed back hard against what Jake Sullivan was telling him. And because Wang Yi went on to Moscow and made it very clear to Jake Sullivan that the Chinese would not be persuaded to weaken their connections to China. It was because of all of this that Jake Sullivan and the United States decided that they needed to publish their own account of the Malta meeting, possibly going back on some kind of implicit understanding to keep this meeting private that they'd reached with the Chinese. Now, that is correct. Then, of course, the publication of the White House readout is going to annoy the Chinese even more. But that is another matter. I will finish discussing this Chinese readout of the meeting between Lavrov and um, Wang Yi by saying that um, the Chinese readout says that Lavrov shared his views on the Ukrainian crisis and applauded China's position paper for accommodating the security concerns of all parties and being conducive to eliminating the root causes of the conflict. In other words, NATO expansion. The Russian side will continue to be open for, to negotiations and dialogue. Wang Yi said that China is committed to the right direction of peace talks and will play a constructive role in the political settlement of the crisis in its own way. So the issue is NATO. Yet again, the topic that the United States refuses to discuss on this issue, the Chinese and the Russians are on the same page. Now, there has apparently been a press conference um, which Lavrov has given, presumably following his meeting with Wang Yi. Um, the Russian foreign ministry has not yet provided a readout, a transcript of this press conference, but the US media has uh, provided some uh, glimmers of some of the things that Lavrov has said. According to the US media, I'm taking this from Zero Hedge, um, Lavrov said um, that no matter what it says, it, the US, controls this war, the war with, um, um, the, war with um, the war in Ukraine. It supplies weapons, munitions, intelligence information, data from satellites. It is pursuing a war against us. And whilst that is going on, what is whilst that whilst what is going on is that Ukraine has been prepared, long prepared for inflicting a strategic defeat to Russia using its hands and its bodies. There is a real plot around the topic of the so-called peace negotiations, as well as attempts to turn everything upside down through pseudo diplomacy. The West has been saying for months that this peace formula is the only basis for negotiations. It starts from innocent topics and then comes to the purpose for which it was concocted, inflicting a strategic defeat on Russia to restore the borders of Ukraine as they were. In 1991, court martial the Russian leadership, force Russia to pay reparations, and then mercifully agree 
to sign a peace agreement. Now, I should say, I've just realised this was a meeting before, this is a press conference before the meeting with Wang Yi. Apparently it was whilst Lavrov was still at the Far Eastern Economic Forum. I haven't yet found a Russian readout. But anyway, the key takeaway is that the Russians perceive this to be a war against them, waged against them by the United States itself. Ukraine is simply a proxy. That's what Lavrov is saying. And he says that all talk about negotiations, all these hints that we're getting from the Americans about negotiations, it's a ruse. The Russians will not fall for it. They're not interested in negotiations along that that kind of basis and what the United States still is seeking is some sort of strategic defeat of Russia. So that seems to be the line that Wang Yi is implicitly endorsing and it's clear that he told Jake Sullivan as much when they met in Malta. So the Chinese economy is starting to recover. It's recovered more strongly in August, and that is now, as expected, widely expected, putting upward pressure on oil prices, which have now hit $95 a barrel. Um, Putin has given a long discussion, he's given a long statement about the state of the Russian economy. He says again that it is surging. He talks about growth this year, Russian growth, being around 2.8%, possibly, as high as that, much higher than the uh, central bank is predicting. They're predicting just 2.2%, higher than the economics ministry was predicting, which is 2.5%. But it seems that growth continues to be strong, despite the recent interest rate, rate, interest rate increases which is why the central bank has increased interest rates again. And can I say once more that undoubtedly part of this growth is due to higher spending on the war, to increases in arms production, but all the indications are that the greater part of it is coming from higher spending, rather from higher spending by Russian consumers which is creating demand, which Russian companies are scrambling to fill, and that's why their order books are full. And we're getting more reports that industry is continuing to register double-digit growth rates, and this, in Moscow, apparently, manufacturing industry is now growing at a rate of 14%, 14% year-on-year. That was a figure I saw. I need to verify it, but that's what I saw. Anyway, that's the situation. So the Chinese, perhaps coming out of the doldrums of their post-pandemic um, period, the Chinese economy is starting to show growth as demand returns. Demand has come to Russia with a vengeance, and their economy is now taking off. In a big way, inflation in Russia has taken off too. As a result, what normally happens when um, demand surges in the way that has happened here, as is happening in Russia at the moment. But I would point out that 6% inflation in Russia, if it's looked back to in, the, in its historic context, and by history I mean in the context up to, well, around 2012, between the, four, the, the, the end of the Soviet Union and around 2012, Russia experienced double-digit inflation in all but one year. So 6% inflation might look rather modest compared with that earlier period of Putin's time. Um, what I would say is that 6% inflation is now high in Russia. Um, the target is 4%, which is, of course, still higher than in the West. 
6% inflation is significantly higher than that, and the real wages are rising um, because of the, in part because of the labour shortage, which the government needs to find some way to ease in some way. 6% um, inflation is high, and of course the Russians have to be worried about it going higher still, thus the interest rate increases and the tightening of fiscal policy with the government, as Putin confirmed, now planning to run a surplus this year and perhaps a surplus next year as well, a surplus in the budget. But what it also shows is that given the recent history of double-digit inflation in Russia, in spite of all the pressures, in spite of all the sanctions, in spite of all the deterioration in relations between the West and Russia, the actual underlying reality is that the Russian economy is becoming more normal, more normal, more like that of a typical advanced country. Its inflation rates are starting to converge with those of other advanced countries. Its budget is changing. It's not becoming so much, so dependent on commodity sales as it was. We're seeing steady increases now in the share in the budget made up of that comes from payroll tax, ta taxes and the non um, non energy sector of the economy. The government, when it needs to raise money to cover a deficit in the budget, which it is more relaxed about running from time to time, but when it needs to raise money to um, cover a deficit, it doesn't go to its rainy day fund, its sovereign wealth fund as it used to do. It prefers to keep money in the sovereign wealth fund and allow it to grow. It's now borrowing, but it's not borrowing abroad. It's borrowing in its own financial markets, Russia's own financial markets. Now, there are still many differences between the Russian economy and Western economies, I mean radical differences, and they will remain so. If it resembles anything, it resembles, I would say, the kind of economies that used to exist in Europe, say in the 1950s and 1960s, more than the economies of today that we see in the West. But anyway, it is becoming a more normal economy. The Budgetary methods are starting to look more like those that one would expect of a developed country. And inflation rates are starting to resemble those of a de developed country increasingly as well. Anyway, that's what I'm going to say over this course of this program. Um, recovery in Russia and China. Economic recession in Europe. Inflationary stresses in China. A new plan to capture Tokmak in the war in Ukraine. All based on shaky evidence that appears to come ultimately from Kirill Budanov's organization. <laughs> That's where we are. And of course, a very unsuccessful meeting between Wang Yi and Jake Sullivan and a happy meeting, a much friendlier meeting, between Wang Yi and Lavrov. So, more from me soon. As I said, this is where I end today. More from me soon. You can, of course, check out all of our programmes on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble, and the others, um, X as well soon. And please remember that you can, find, you can also support our work by Patreon and Subscribe Star. The link's under the video, and by going to our shop and buying the things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, all those great things. And last but not least, if you've liked this video, remember to press the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. And, well, all that remains is for me to wish you a very good day.
and to say again that I'll be back soon.